Hello, Sharks. I am here with just GTO Justin Sleeva. Say hello, Justin. Hey, everybody. Justin is the master of GTO, and, um, well, I am not. So he is going to go through a few of these very, very, very intricate, difficult spots in Biosolver, and we are going to see what the optimal play is. So let's get right to it. So these are all going to be from um, the U.S. Poker Open that we both played. You played more than I did um, a few months ago, and... I just found these four hands to be pretty interesting. Uh, so ran it through Pio, and we can start going through it. Let's so go. Pocket aces, here we go. Pretty good hand. You raise it up and bury three bets here. So what, what does your strategy look like facing a three bet um, about 45 big blinds deep here? So he goes kind of big, right? I make it nine, he makes it 35. And... I guess I'm supposed to just start shoving with some stuff like kings, queens, jacks, ace, king, ace, queen, stuff like that. Um, a decent amount of calling. Calling with aces for sure, I think. Calling with um, suited, connected, good cards. You know, just big cards for the most part. Yeah. Roughly following GTO charts in this scenario. Barry's a good, strong GTO player, I think. Maybe a little bit on the tighter side. Probably, I mean, I don't expect him to be just like running too many bluffs here, but I bet if he looked at a GTO chart, he's just going to do what the GTO chart says in the spot. Yeah. Is that your yeah, I think that's... assessment as well? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think Barry's a pretty strong player. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like most of what you said in, in terms of, like, your strategy. I think that when we're in position in the spot versus being out of position, you're just going to call infinitely more, right? Sure. Um, I assume even, like, your jacks and queens are going to find some calls in the spot. I think your kings are going to be the ones that really want to say all in. And then ace is obviously trap. Um, let's look at the preflop strategy for this spot. Yeah, so this was a, about your calling range here, where you you actually are going to find a ton of calling, even with like ace king type stuff. Okay. I think most people just say all in. Yeah, um, I mean, but, I, I, if you gave me a hand like ace king offsuit, I'm all in literally every time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's like pretty normal. And, and against the population that's not really really strong, I think that's like probably pretty good. But you can imagine that if somebody's like out of position finding these three bets here mm -hmm. it's pretty sick just to like keep them in with their ace 10 offsuit in the spot when you have ace king right that and makes you, sense yeah you're gonna get to navigate spot uh pretty well playing in position so okay you go with the call with aces which obviously is, is great um, whenever you're or, at roughly this stacked up to 40 big lines you just basically always slow play the aces right in yeah position for sure yeah no and even out no, of position right for sure. Now, there's definitely some players in the field where I think jamming becomes really good. Like, if you just don't think they have bluffs out of the big blind here, right. it's really nice just to stack them right away. Um, so I think it's, I, 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 I've definitely seen some really good players um, just, like, be all in with aces here against certain player types that they don't think are bluffing pre. That way, they just always stack pocket jacks, you know? Right. Uh, they always stack ace-king. But that against a player sense. with bluffs, yeah. I think it's obviously great to go for the trap here. I will say, I don't imagine Barry is three-betting quite the three-betting range you just showed a second ago. I think he's probably not finding all those bluffs, right? Like, you you really think he's three-betting a king-six suited? Like, no. Uh, per, yeah, pretty unlikely. It, it, King-nine suited? Probably not. Ten-eight suited? Probably not. So, it, let's let's presume he is missing just some of these three-bets. In yeah. that case, should we be more inclined to four bet? But still probably not because we just want to keep ace. We just we want to slow play hard. Right? I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's not as, like he's super nitty. Yeah, agreed, agreed. As his range gets like more constricted, more constricted, you should be fast playing more and more. Mm -hmm. But aces are still going to be the one that's going to fast play the least often. So maybe your kings just say all in every time and your queens say all in, you know, 55% of the time instead of uh, 30 Right. But but I still think aces, and even ace king suit, you can just say all in right away. But then aces, I think, still just trapping is, is great. Are your charts here presuming his kind of big three bet size? Uh, yeah, it's a 4x size. Okay. Yeah. Is 4x kind of big, 40 big blinds deep in the spot, or is that just like what we should be doing? Um, So from the big blind, like, he's not like that polar, so I think it's fine to use a slightly smaller size. Um, one thing I have been seeing happen in some of these pre flop simulations is that. Sometimes it's good to use a really small three bet size and just target their offsuit ASA or their offsuit uh, Broadway cards. Hmm. Like in this spot, you're opening like, you know, Queen 10 Jack 10 um, you know, Ace 9 0. And if you use a small three bet size, you're really just like targeting those hands. 
um, which becomes like pretty efficient as a three bet size. If you always think that they're pretty much going to continue like kind of a static range, no matter what size you use, because it's pretty hard to fold a pair here and it's pretty hard to fold like your suited Broadway. So I think a three bet size to a, a smaller size can be really good against some players. Um, but in general, four X is fine here. Okay. Sorry. Right. Six, four, four. Oh, by the way, I did. I, I was thinking about this hand that I played against Barry also this series. I know he used a smaller three bet size at some other point where I think it was a very similar spot. I think he made like 27 K or something. So Interesting. he's using two different sizes in this scenario. Okay, cool. Somehow, some way. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. It makes some sense. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, yeah. I, I'm telling you, I saw it. So okay. yeah, no, no, it's cool. I mean, it can, it can, people can be really tricky in the spots and Barry's definitely like a guy who can, uh, who, who can be tricky and can, um, you know, make, mix it up with bigger sizes with certain hands thinking that it's really good. And you know, it's always been... dynamic with Barry. We used to play a lot together, just like at random WPTs, especially in cash games. And I literally never fold him. So Gosh, okay, nice. he loves to blast. And yeah, especially back in the day, I heard. back in the day he used to, but I feel like he's chilled out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think he just tries to play really well in, in most cases. I now. think that's probably it too. Okay. So anyway, six, four, four, this is, we have the nuts. Yep. He goes for this really tiny bet size. I think that this is like, um, I think tiny bets out of position in three of pots in general work really well if you're continuing with the correct range. Because if we look at what this looks like in a solver, it's he's supposed to use like a, a more of a bet 25% pot size. And when he goes like 10K into 76, you actually have to call the entire deck. Right. Because you're in position here. So you're folding one combo, which is clean <laughs> 10 of hearts, yeah. right? So like I get why he went so small because it's it's pretty hard to look at like you know, Jack, 10 of hearts here and just always continue your hand. Um, so I have a question general, about this. Do you think that he is doing this exploitatively against me and or against the player pool? Or do you think that he just thinks this is the right GTO play? It's hard to say. I'm not sure. It, it's, it's always really difficult to say. I mean, it's not that big of like a, like the EV difference between using a bet 25% pot and a bet you know, 10 and 76 here, like, isn't that much of a difference? Um, but if we think about his range, like, he does still want some protection when he has the jacks and the queens. And, sure. you know, if he uses this, like, about 25% size, all of a sudden you get King Queen O to fold, which is like, we don't really hate. You're never really going to bluff King Queen O on a future street very often. Um, and so when you have, like, 10s, it's kind of nice to make King Queen fold and put money in against, like, nines through fives. Um, put more money in than just like a tiny bet. So yeah, I, I don't know if he's doing it for exploitative reasons or if he thinks it's like the best size to use, but. So, so let's go back to the small size. I will say something that I basically never do in the spot is raise with much of anything. Yeah. Which probably makes the small size even better, right? Agreed. Like if you're just not going to get raised, it's almost like you're checking to some extent, but getting a little bit of money in the pot. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, I gave think... me eights here. I just wouldn't raise. Yeah. I, and I actually think that against really tiny bits out of position, in position raises can be really, really good. And we'll actually see that in another three bet pot uh, that you played against Chidwick, where raising in position becomes just like really, really sick. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to find raises in the spot. Um, well, I mean, the hands that should raise are kind of logical, right? They're the, the best hand, the, the hands that are most vulnerable that you're just not folding, right? Yeah. Plus some bluffs. And it's kind of hard to find the bluffs in this in these scenarios too like i'm ever really raising the king queen offsuit or the ace eight suited or whatever um no <laughs> you know i'm just not so yeah. so i mean that makes the small bet size really good against me yeah yeah i, th I think it's it, it's totally reasonable yeah okay so uh, we need to raise a little bit more yeah well that's another question do we even need to raise notice our raising is what 17 percent, which is some but not a ton yeah i, I mean I, th I think it's good in general like when you have hands that don't, that are like on the fringe of continuing, especially like a hand like Jack 10 of hearts, mm -hmm. like, like Jack 10 of hearts to me feels really hard to play as a call here. Not, not hard, but like, if you think he's using a really tiny bet size with a lot of his range, I think it is totally reasonable to find some raises here in position because when you raise, he just has to continue infinite, but you get him to like, just look at ace queen O and find folds. Yeah. King Jack suit and find some folds. So I think in general, small raises in position in the spot is like, is, is pretty reasonable. I mean, pretty, anytime you're facing like a really tiny bet, raising becomes at least an option, it seems. 
Yeah, it's almost like you're facing a check, right? right. The tinier the bet, the more your range just plays like a check. Like okay. flight versus a check. Cool. So anyway, aces mostly call. You yeah. Call aces every time here, literally. Yeah, yeah, I think it's totally reasonable. So you call, and then we get the eight of spades. Okay, fine. Fine. And he does something. Yeah, he does something interesting here where he goes for a third pot bet. And what did you think in game when he kind of made this size? I am thinking I want to keep him in with all of his bluffs. <laughs> yeah. That's my main concern here because he could easily have just like random over cards, right? And probably not all that many hands that have any equity. I mean, I have the ace of spades, so he blocked the most logical flush draw, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I just have super nuts here and I just want to keep him in with everything. Nice, yeah. And then, and then now would you find some raises with a hand like uh, maybe like pocket red pocket nines? Um, yeah, I think so. I think it becomes more reasonable here because for the same reason, now it's just more, the board's a little bit more coordinated. Although to be fair, it's not like we're so worried about getting outdrawn in these scenarios, but the pot's bigger, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I think that all that makes sense to me. It's like, again, like what bluffs am I finding? I mean, just spades, you know? Yeah. It depends if we use a small race size. I assume that, uh, yeah, you so can only really have an all in. It, or it goes all in only. Yeah, yeah, so if you only have like an all in here, you need equity when you raise, right? It's so like your nine, like your non spade nines here make mm -hmm. sense to raise, which I think makes sense. And then the the king queen and king ten are gonna be flush draws, right? No, some just stone air ball bluffs, huh? <sighs> yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody finds these or needs but to find. Maybe we should be, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I I would literally never shove all in with the king queen of hearts here, but may, I mean, if you tell me it's good, I guess I should. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? No, I cannot imagine, but it's what it says to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah at a very tiny frequency against somebody who needs to be barreling like you know at correct frequency this but... presumes he has all the bluffs which again he's he's missing half these bluffs preflop probably yeah and yeah, I think not, that... there's no guarantee he's going to bet it on the turn right yeah now what i will say is in game i think it's pretty hard for people to come bet 30 here with much of anything right like your range looks like a lot of pairs in the spot i mean i'm, I'm gonna so... float a slot bet with everything I really, I, I promise you, I actually would float with pretty much yeah. everything besides like maybe say, suit high cards. With no say suit. he has like queens though. Like yeah. it feels like in game, people use the bigger size of queens a lot more often. Not a huge size, but like about 55% pot, mm -hmm. about 60% pot size. Um, same with like pocket jacks or tens. Yeah. Like it, it feels unlikely to me that people are like, okay, let me just like, I don't know, target their ace high still. It feels like they kind of want to like put more money into pop than that yeah. in game at least. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It certainly. I mean, let's so they use, like, us, right? So yeah, and that's why you see like the tiny size being used with like the aces and the ace king still for value. Um, now the now the solver will still use about ten percent pot here and not about thirty. So I actually think that Barry, um, if he's doing it with these types of hands, is is using too big of a size. Okay. But yeah, yeah, I think it's a pretty reasonable strategy overall. So you guys with the bet thirty. You have the easy pure call here. You're just hoping to put all the money in by the river. An important point here is that we saw Kings also just calling as well. So like you're really not even all that concerned with Kings. Nice. Yeah. 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 And exactly. Queens, you know, like we just have the super nuts and you really, really, really want to keep them in. Yeah, for sure. And then one concept that we'll see later in, in a third pot is that your over pairs with the spade want to put money in because at deeper stacks, you want to have more equity in general, or you want to block continues. But in this spot, it's a lot more shallow stack. And so the raises come from the need for protection. Okay. And so you see like nines, right? Nines are the pair that are like, I have a pair that I'm always going broke with, but I also need the most protection possible. So I'm going to go all in. Right. Whereas I think a lot of people nine... may look at this, by the way, and think, oh man, we're really getting in with nines, but what about when he has aces, kings, queens, jacks? And the answer is you just lose. Yeah. yeah it is sure. okay to just lose. So many players I talk to are like, but what about when they have you beat? And here he really easily could have us beat, right? I mean, he would Absolutely. play aces, kings, queens, jacks all the same way, maybe. Yep. Huh. So you, you just lose sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All but right. but I mean, once again, like we're playing really good players, so like we can't, right. yeah, I mean, you're not going to be deviating like unbelievably far from what you think is good against guys like Barry and Chidwick and, you know, Petrangelo and these guys. Like if you deviate far, no matter what you're doing, you're going to be like, kind of getting in rough spots in general. So a question for people who are playing, let's say $3,500 buy-in WPTs against players like Chidwick who decide to go and play those tournaments. Should they still just be trying to play as close to GTO as possible or should they be trying to make random exploits? 
Yeah, I mean, against like really good players, no matter what the field is, I would always just be trying to play really well. And, and if anything, I would maybe even try to put more pressure on them because Chidwick's going to sit at a 3,500, obviously being like one of the best players in the field. And he's not like, he's, he's not going to deviate far, but I think that pros when they play in those spots, especially really good pros are much more likely to deviate into a passive realm when they're facing a lot of aggression. Right. Um, from like, they don't want to go broke. Exactly. Right. Like they know that the value of the tournament is like much higher than that. Right. Cause if they go broke, they cannot play future hands with an edge. Right. So they only take a roughly break even spot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. If it's in the re-entry period, maybe uh, tighten up a little bit, but yeah, but um, yeah, they care. know that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've seen Justin play tournaments. <laughs> he enjoys the re-entry. I, I do enjoy a good re-entry. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right, so you got 15K the other day. That's good. Hey, Did thanks. You, you chopped it or won it or what? Yeah, do? we chopped it up. Nice. Chopped for like 100K. So that felt good. Nice little, nice little win at the end. Yeah, I asked him if they wanted to battle. I, I, uh, I was hoping to play out three-handed because you don't get. You don't get to play out three-handed that often. So I wanted to play, but they were all like, come on, let's go home. <laughs> but they didn't want to play, so we just chopped it up. All right, River's an eight. We still have the nuts. Yeah, and so he checks here. I mean, just all in, right? Yeah, yeah, I think your decision's easy. It's it's more interesting to me in terms of what his strategy is here because, like, you're going all in for, like, 70% pot. So it's pretty... What, which eight was it? Eight of diamonds. It's a pretty rough spot for him. So... He himself is going to be jamming his pairs, mm -hmm. mixing his kings and aces. Um, so he doesn't really have very many good hands when he checks. So he does not have many really good hands when he checks, exactly. And so when he jams, you just have to call your pairs, and you have to call your good aces. And when I say good aces, I mean your good blocker aces, right? right. Like, um, like obviously, your, your ace 10 of spades is a much better bluff catcher than ace queen of diamonds because he's going to bluff with the queen of diamonds in his hand at some frequency. Mm -hmm. um, and so having the 10 of spades in your hand is a better bluff catcher than, than like ace jack. But yeah, you're not really folding a pair or anything. And then versus check. I think a lot of people may look at this and say, you're really just calling it off with the ace high. The answer is yes. Cause he has a lot of, well, in theory, he should have a lot of bluffs. I will say again, if he's missing a lot of those low or like middle connected suited type hands, maybe we should start folding a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And, all, and also an adjustment like from, like if he thinks you're a station, he might never bluff Queen Jack on the river. That's but true. If, you, if he knows me and I literally call every time, he should probably yeah. not bluff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I mean, you have to adjust that in game because like if if people think you're a station in these spots and they don't bluff, and then you call it correct frequencies, you're torching. Yeah, that's the tough uh, thing though because there's always this fine line when you're playing as good players. Like, are they just trying to play GTO, or do they actually think I'm just a station and I'm going to call them every time? Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, well, that, that's. That's the matter you have to figure out. But but I mean for the most part, I would I would say pretty close to what you think is like really good strategies. Yeah. Um but yeah, there's definitely gonna be spots where where you're gonna have to overfold, especially on the river, even against the best players in the world. Sure. Okay. So anyway, he well, we're obviously shoving. I'm shoving or checking on the river, right? We're we're not doing any tiny betting. Right yeah, no, no. No tiny bets allowed in these spots. This it's is actually straight from cool. the tournament masterclass. We looked at this spot a lot on the river where whenever you have two thirds pot or even pot a lot of the time. You're just not going small nice. in position. Yeah, yeah. So what should we be bluffing with is my question, because obviously the pairs all get to shove. Let's see all the pairs. The seven shove? Yeah, seven shoves, which is interesting. Yeah. I because about, I'm once trying you to find, like, how bad can we shove for value, right? Yeah. I'm kind of surprised seven shoves. That feels maybe a little bit... I guess if he shoves all just... those better pairs, we basically have to Exactly. Pass. Exactly. Um, this is a spot where I would deviate really hard in a field where, like, I think people aren't shoving enough out of position here. Like if they're not shoving jacks, obviously it's a torch to shove sevens. But I really think that they're just going to shove jacks and try to stack your sevens. Um, right. And so if they're shoving all their over pairs, it's like you're just targeting ace high on the river. And so all your pairs are worth um, worth a shove here, except for fives. And even five shoves a little bit. Okay. So then for our bluffs, we're just basically taking our hands that lack showdown value in the spot, right? Because a lot the rest of our hands are like ace high that have showdown value and king high that so have showdown value. It's a little bit interesting here because one thing that we see happen is when you're facing a range that's so weak, you actually get to shove and fold them off chops, mm -hmm. um, which is cool. So you obviously have your king jack, and your king jack, if you floated uh, turn, is like your best bluffing candidate, right? Your queen jack of spades has to bluff, your queen 10, your jack 10. So like anything's non-ace high pretty much has to bluff, except for your worst blockers, like king 10 of uh, the king high spades aren't great. 
yeah, if we look at that, like your king high spades and your ace high spades always check. And, and why are they checking? Is it just purely because of showdown value or are those cards that block some of his folds? Exactly. Yeah. But, but it's one of the, I, I'm not actually sure which one it is. Is it combo so or hope? It's going to be the second. Your king highs, I don't think have much showdown value here. But if that's the case, then why is the queen high bluffing? Because they block um, the spades too. Well, but the queen high unblocks his king high spades. Okay. Okay. And so your queen highs get his king highs to fold. Okay. So there's, there's like a more a higher benefit of it. Right. So it's not necessarily uh, showdown value. So they, there are more hands available that you can make fold. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. When you have the king of spades, you get a showdown versus his queen ten of spades. Right. But when you have the queen high spades, um, you end up losing to his king high. Okay. Cool. And so yeah, you get to shove your ace king and stuff as just purely just fold him off chops. Once I don't again, think you... I would have shoved ace king here. That would have been a mistake. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's I think that's pretty reasonable to check that one back. Like I know I would have bluffed a lot of the non showdown value hands, right? Like, yeah. Queen, queen high and lower for sure. Just because yeah. like in this spot I realize I don't have any of those really. So when you have them, you probably just want to bluff them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um I probably would have checked just like all the ace high. And to be <laughs> fair, it doesn't look like that's that big of a punt. Yeah, no, that's totally reasonable to me. I'm not sure if I would have jammed seven. I mean, I always look at these spots and ask, like, what would I have done wrong? You know? Yeah. Because you want to try to play better, right? So yeah, I think those are sure. spots where I would have played slightly wrong. And if you're watching this video, you know, ask yourself, would you have played roughly like this? And if you're, in my mind, if you're playing roughly like this, you're going to be fine. But if yeah, you're doing totally. something like checking jacks or something, then you're blundering, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, I totally agree. Or if you're finding zero bluffs, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's something else a lot of people do wrong. Okay, so anyway, we have an easy shot. Yeah, so we find the shove, and then he has to just mix his ace king, which is what happened in game. I don't know how quickly he called this spot, he but forever. Yeah, yeah, I assume so. It's a hard spot, um, and he called the ace king of diamonds. And as you can see here, like ace king of diamonds calls about two thirds of the time. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean he he played this close to correct, and and uh, and you played this perfectly, and and you got a nice double up early. So yeah, I thought this was an interesting hand. Um, three at pots facing really tiny sizes, and then a weird spot on the river where. Um, yeah, you just get to go really thin and target his ace high. So why is a seven an ace? Why is a seven calling every time? Yeah, so a seven isn't blocking any bluffs, whereas ace king o is going to block your king jack non spade bluffs, king right, ten right. non spade bluffs. Okay. So it's all about the second card not interacting with your bluffs. Gotcha. And yeah. the seven does not interact at all, and all the ace highs are the same. Exactly. So yeah. you find the call there. Okay. All yeah. right, next hand. Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, this one was versus Brewer. I'm sure you remember this. This was an interesting one. This is Chris Brewer. He gets in there. He battles hard. Yeah, very good. He tries good. to play pretty GTO, but I get the vibe. He takes basically every bluff spot he possibly can. <laughs> At least against me. Maybe he thinks I... To be fair, he thinks I call every time too because I call literally every time and he shows me the nuts every time. <laughs> that's surprising. He doesn't show the nuts to that many people. No, I have I have seen the nuts. He, like usually backdoor nuts or something. He showed me <laughs> seven or eight times in a row. Anyway, here we go. And I, I know he's doing it with non-nuts, so I just like keep calling, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think in general he just he is super aggressive, tries to play really well. That is um, an interesting uh, mindset flaw I think a lot of people have, is they're playing against someone who they know gets in there and battles hard, but they just happen to be shown the nuts against them four times in a row. And you got to realize loose, aggressive, battling players are going to have the nuts sometimes. Yeah. And don't think that they're just not bluffing you. It's just they probably haven't had the bluffing opportunity a few times you happen to play with each other because it's not like you have a big sample with anybody. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, some of my friends, um, you know, thought for a period of time that I was just like super out of line aggressive, especially well, right. in like these types of fields. And I am, I am very <laughs> aggressive, but I was, but I also had to remind them that like, look, I'm just trying to play good strategies. And it just so happens that in live terms, you don't get to play that many hands. Mm -hmm. And I just had the bluffing candidates for like the last six hands. Yeah. So it looks like I'm going crazy because I haven't had value, but it's such a tiny sample. Um, and if I get value six times in a row and they think I'm crazy and they adjust, I'm going to be crushing them, right? So you it, it's a funny thing. Yeah, you have to be careful for deviating, especially in small samples, especially in live poker where like you just don't get to play that many spots. Right. All right, so here we flop flush draw. I suppose we just bet small and frequently. Yeah, yeah. So the, if you, if you were at a little bit of a shorter stack, I think you would increase your betting frequency. But he actually has a lot more flushes here, and so at like really deep SPRs, I think you need to find some checks. Does he have a lot more flushes here? Yeah, yeah. Think about how much of the deck he's defending. 
Well, he's blocking the, the board blocks a lot of them. Well, yeah, yeah, but um, when you're comparing flushes, you have all the A side flushes. He has all the A side flushes. Mm -hmm. You well, have he three bets on them. He three bets on them. You have maybe like king five of diamonds and better. He has all the king high of diamonds. Yeah. You have maybe like queen seven or eight of diamonds. He has all the diamonds. You have ten eight of diamonds. He has all the ten diamonds. I suppose, but my range is substantially tighter than his. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Therefore, proportionally, don't I have more flushes and flush nut flush draws, right? Proportionally speak, does that matter? This proportion. Let's see. Yeah, no, it does. For sure. Because, like, yeah, he has all of them, but he has all the other junk too. Yeah. No. I mean, so you are right. You have a big equity advantage throughout. But I think that the reason why you develop checks, let me make sure you develop checks first. So I'm not just, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here we're betting small 70%, 67%. Yeah. And so I, sure. I, I, I think mean, that's probably, I mean, that's, that's roughly right. Yeah. And I think that what happens here, oh, I can't make this bigger. I think that what happens is you are right. Like proportionally, you do have more flushes. You have 6% of flushes. Um, he has 6.5% of flushes. But mine are better. Uh, okay. He does have more flushes. But mine are better. Yours are better. Um, but if you start betting your entire range, he just gets to polarize around his flushes and then overfold the flop a ton. And you have a huge portion of your range that's like, you have way more good top pair. You have way more good over pairs. Yeah. Um, well, so when I say bet frequently, I don't mean like bet 100% or anything. But to be fair, I probably would have bet like every aces here. I just, I would have. And then yeah. I would definitely check some stuff like top pair, marginal kicker, like, you know, jack 10, 10, 9. Yeah. Stuff like that. I think like the logical hands I would have checked. I would have basically done what the tournament masterclass said to do, which would have been close. But I'm, I am right. surprised to see it use such a mixed strategy here. I guess all the bets are coming with diamonds or almost entirely diamonds, right? Yeah. Like so this hands. exactly. This is kind of a fun spot where it. Well, actually, no, it's mixing all that up as well. Look. Yeah, so well, what I was going to say is it's kind of a fun spot where, like, it's the opposite of the last hand where your nines with no spade one and two bet for protection. But in this spot, you're really deep. And so your aces with a diamond want to put money in the pot because they have a lot easier time defending versus check raises and aggression. Mm -hmm. And then you're balancing your strategy out with single diamond hands um, that can easily call some streets. So you have, like, like tens with a diamond. Let's see. I assume tens no diamond checks a lot. A queen with a diamond. So you, I mean, you have to have high diamonds to check back, right? So you can call a lot of turns, presumably. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. And it is it is pretty mixed throughout. So in uh, spots like this, where you know it's pretty mixed throughout, what do you do when trying to play well? I just try to mix all my hands at a reasonable frequency. Yeah, because that's um, basically what it's doing to some extent. I mean, you're gonna be off by a little bit here and there. Yeah. Yeah. So and in I mean, spots in general, like this where you know it bets two thirds of the time with almost everything, you just bet two thirds of the time. Well, I mean, for my specific hand. So, like, if I have aces with a diamond here, I'm going to be really inclined to just bet pure. As I don't a person would... like myself, where I don't know ace of diamonds, ace of spades, bets 100%, though. But I know I'm supposed to bet these spots about two-thirds of the time. What can you do? Or nothing. Study more. Um, <laughs> well, it's going to be... Because, hmm. I mean, like, like, I'm telling you what I probably would have done here. I would have checked back a lot of the top pair bad kickers and middle pairs. That's mostly yeah. what I would have checked back. And I would have checked back some, like, ace of diamonds x some portion of the time and some king of diamonds x some portion of the time yeah that like everything else <laughs> yeah yeah i i think that's going to be pretty fine just in general here's one good concept that i see in these spots that i think everybody can use is that the bigger the gap between your two cards that are flushes the more they typically bet and so like your king five diamonds here is going to bet almost pure hmm. whereas your king queen of diamonds finds more checks okay. your ace two of diamonds is going to bet almost pure your ace king of diamonds a lot of checks and the reason for that is the bigger the gap, the more flushes your opponent can have that you cool them. Um, and so I would utilize that concept in game where like when you have the king five, just bet pure. And then when you have the ace king of diamonds, maybe trap brewer, right? Because he's going to be check raising you a lot with the ace with the king of diamonds in his hand. And so when you have both, it's kind of nice to let it go check, check and just let him develop uh, turn bluffs. Okay, cool. So yeah, that, that's, that's one thing I would look for. So you go for... 30% bet, which is great, cause, and we get the four of spades. So what's your rough strategy in this spot? Oh, I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> so in spots like this, if I am betting, I want to make sure I can reasonably call a raise, right? I'm not trying to bet and fold. 
Yeah. So that's important, I think. So is this a hand we need to bet? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a reasonable hand to consider tripling if I feel inclined. I mean, I'd rather have ace with a with a brick X, I think, than a king, right? Because this what would, would be a brick X? Value. Oh, okay, so you're saying for showdown value. So one of the things that's nice about the king is that you're unblocking all of his like middling cards that would continue to flop. Mm-hmm. So that's if we true. look at so if we look at like bet thirty call four of spades. Notice he's so, tracking everything. Yeah, yeah, he definitely can't lead here. Some so people this, think you're supposed to randomly lead in these spots. I just want to show like it just doesn't lead. No, huh? Yeah, you're still crushing him in terms of equity. He I remember reviewing hands on YouTube so often on three flush boards, people just lead. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's just not good, and they do it all the time. It's interesting. You're actually not... So, yeah, these spots are so funny. So you're actually... You do lose the range advantage, but he just check raises so many of his knots on the flop. Like, if we look at how his diamonds play, look, like, it's the same concept as the big gap. Mm-hmm. When you have a big gap, you raise more out of position. So his ace two of diamonds, almost pure raise. King two of diamonds, heavy raise. And then as you trend to a higher second card, you do less raising. And so this like eight, just like so hard to implement. They're like, look, the random eight raises, eight of X dime, eight of diamonds, X of diamonds raises, but 10 doesn't. It's like, come on, man. Six doesn't. Yeah. Six doesn't, but eight, exactly only eight does. It's it's hard to implement this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is That's hard. That's why you ask me, what am I doing in the spot? Like, I don't know. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because look at the strategy. How are you going to implement this? So I think that I think that it's pretty reasonable to implement and say that, okay, like, my best raises, like, my best raise candidates, I'm going to raise at a very high frequency. So sure, just, like, always like how raise How do you know the random eight is the one that, doing, that, that does it compared to the ten? You know, because they're both gut shots. Or they both have a straight blocker and i get that the eight has more reason for protection but yeah i actually think what one thing that happens and in, in one thing that's happening in this spot is that when you have the eight you can make one straight flush besides the eight six which is the ten of diamonds whereas when you have the ten uh no you can't make two I'm trying to think there has sometimes to be some reason. no answer <laughs> no there's always an answer there's always an answer there, there's sometimes I, I bet it's that the eight needs more protection you know, call it protection, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, anyway, let's not get bogged down on this tiny point here. Um, <laughs> okay. There is a reason. Justin has to find yeah. the answer. That's how you get really good at poker. <laughs> I'll find the answer later. And I'll, and uh, I'll, I'm a little I'll, bit quicker to just say, I don't know what's happening in this spot as long as I bet some check some and play reasonably enough, it's going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. Which is I, probably why I'm not one of the top five poker players in the world. And, uh, you know, Justin just might be there. <laughs> I don't think so, but may, maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, turn comes four spades. I mean, I got to presume we're supposed to be betting some diamonds, right? Yeah, so yeah, and, and I king, think... The ace-king, let's look at the ace-king, I'm curious. So you're a pretty heavy bet Yeah. for the best 60 size with, with some checking. If you, know um, if you know you can bet it and not fold it, you should just bet it. Whereas if you have a hand like, um, I don't know, find, find a... Do we even have any offsuit hands that don't have a pair? Yeah, like, so your, your ace-10-0 with the 10 of diamonds is an interesting, like, difference here. So you have to think like, which one's better, your ace king or your ace 10? And in this spot, your ace king is better uh, with the ace of diamonds rather than your ace 10 with the 10 of diamonds. Same thing with having the king of diamonds in your hand. And I well, think that's, be- well, yeah, I think it's because you're just blocking more continues, right? But like also your- the 10 of diamonds is just worse, but it has equity. Yeah. I don't want to bet yeah. a draw, quote unquote draw, that has decent equity, but would have to fold to a raise. Yeah, and the ten, yeah, I think it's ten with the ten of diamonds probably has to fold, which sucks. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I think it's totally reasonable. So that's like way to... my thought process. I don't know if it's actually right. But... Yeah, no, I, I like that. I think that's I think that's good. Okay. And then in terms of your, like your over pairs in the spot, it's the same thing we kind of talked about before, where now your red aces in the spot or your you know ace no diamond in the spot, it really doesn't want to get check raise on the turn. Right. Like you're just playing too deep that you really don't want to put much money in, and you just get to call so many river bets and induce bluffs. Um, that makes it pretty nice. And so when you have the ace of diamonds, like king, which you have in this hand, you're taking away all of the ace of diamonds that would continue from your opponent, which is weighting them a little bit to having a lot of more just like pairs. And so you see that like all of these have the ace of diamonds in their hand. And so if you're blocking this entire section of hands, this they're going to the have, opponent's hand for this is the opponent's hands, yeah. right? They're going to have way more just like jack, nine, seven. And so making them fold just like, black nine six suited is pretty sweet for you 
I think something else a lot of people do wrong here is they think they want to be betting all their aces because they really don't want to get outdrawn. Simple as that. But that's not necessarily a good play because, like you said, you do get to call on a lot of rivers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. When you say a lot, though, to be fair, there's a lot of bad rivers where if they bet the river, you don't love it. But that's That's just okay because you really don't want to get check-raised. Agreed. You really don't want to get check-raised, which should happen about 12% of the time. And you also kind of keep him in with a bunch of stuff that's drawing almost dead, Mm -hmm. right? Like, look at all the hands when you bet he's folding. He's folding a7, king7, queen7, 9-6, 9-5, queen9, ace9. Like, these hands have such little equity against your black aces that it's kind of nice to keep them in there and then go for value on the river um win check to a lot of times as and well also some of their flush draws may feel inclined to bluff the river busted oh, flush yeah, draws, right sure. which you can just easily call for sure for sure so th- yeah. it's almost like you have to weigh these two things which is worse the times where you bet the turn to get raised or the times where you check check and then get outdrawn on the river for a small yeah. lot so it's not yeah. the deal sometimes you get outdrawn agreed agreed yeah, I think I think checking there is really nice. So you go with the check, which which I think is totally fine. Did I check or bet this time? Are you sure? You check. Oh, I did check. Okay. Yeah. Ah, should have bet. Clearly, should have bet. I, I don't think that's true. I think. Uh, you know, I, I will say against players like Chris Brewer, who I know like to check raise. I am way less inclined to bet in spots where I don't want to get check raised, and I don't really want to bet this hand to get check raised, right? And that may be a, a bad tendency of mine. Um. Or maybe it's maybe it's good. I don't know. Like if you put me in this spot in a super soft tournament where there's only one other good player at the table, I'm definitely going to take passive lines. I think because I really, really, really want to hang around at the table with all the other bad players. Sure. But maybe that's not a good thought process. Sure. No, I, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I think against guys like Chris, you just have to play like what you think is good. Yeah. yeah. Like, all right. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I, I mean, checking here with this hand is totally fine, but I think you should be betting at a high frequency. It doesn't um, look totally fine. It looks like it's checking like 15% of the time or 10% of the time. 15 is a real number, though. That, that's true, but uh, I mean, to be fair, earlier I said I, I would be fine betting this hand, so maybe I did just randomly check it. Maybe I thought he yeah. liked his hand. Who knows? Yeah, for sure. If you for can sure. look and tell they like their hand with some godlike reading abilities, then uh, maybe, maybe you just check it back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. If, you think, if you think the check raise is coming, then don't bet. <laughs> easy game yeah. easy game so we get the five diamonds and he goes for 10 percent pot yeah, he does this fancy stuff uh this is this is i'm sure this is some gto approved strategy and yeah. uh, he does it a yeah. lot of people don't yeah. do this though but he does this kind of stuff so this is where the wheels fall off on my strategy because you never really play against, or you don't play against people who do this all that often correctly right agreed and so when he's developing a bet 10 percent strategy right let's just think about how we should roughly construct his range mm-hmm. He needs to have a little bit of, a, and you talk about this in the term masterclass. He needs to have a little tiny percentage of nut hands mm-hmm. that can protect the range, kind of. He's That's gonna have gonna a be huge... ace high flushes and straight flushes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that makes total sense at a small frequency, right? Tiny frequency, um, yeah. And then his whole middling, por- like the huge portion of his bet 10 range is thin value hands. So, what it's are thin... thin value in this scenario? I mean, it's gotta be like bad flushes down yep. to stuff like jacks or maybe nines. Right, like probably jacks, right? Yeah, a lot of two pair fits into this bet ten, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The nine five, the nine four. Basically, hands stop. between bad flushes down to top pairs, right? Maybe middle yeah, pairs. There's actually not that many bad flushes in here. Most of the, most okay. of the weaker flushes probably go into a bet twenty five size because they're worth okay. a little bit more. So it's okay. So it's even even weaker hands. Yeah, but it's it's like a big two pair portion of his range. So I think a lot of people will hear you say that. Okay, so say his range is a few nuts, mostly two pair, and then some yeah. bluffs. Tiny so amount of bluffs. make him really, really easy to play against. You can just raise him every time. Well, if you raise him every time, because he has that portion of nuts, he gets to develop three betting strategies, right? Mm-hmm. And so his range has a lot of two pair, but it still has some nuts, and that's why it's like protected a little bit. And so if you raise him a lot, he's just going to three bet you a lot. I don't know if you and can click, click, click the bet small for him. Yep. And then click a raise small for us. Okay. Now, let's see what he's supposed to do. Notice here, he's supposed to be calling with a lot of two pairs and whatnot, right? Yeah, about half the time. So the question is, is will your opponent who uses this strategy find the hero calls? Notice like jack seven, jack five, jack four all call, right? Yeah. Jack nine all calls. Some people do, some people won't. Imagine he folds out all of those, though, as some people will. 
then I think this is like a pretty strong line against some people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If they're going to bet 10 correctly and then overfold, it's for sure a spot where you should just look to bluff everything. Yeah. Um, totally agree with that. But and, some and people... No, to be fair, he, when you bet, he bets tiny on the river, you have us raising to 5x's bet. So it's like it's egregiously small. This is a real raise size, right? Yeah. And he's still supposed to call the stuff like two pair. A decent yeah. chunk of the time. Yeah, and for I sure. I think a lot of people who have studied... GTO, some but not a lot, will bet small on the river here, stuff like two pair, and then oh, drastically overfold it to a raise. I think, yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, no, I, I think that's like somewhat reasonable. The one thing I would be a little bit concerned of is if they think you're going to raise them a lot and they start putting in more nut hands. Sure. Like, like I think that some people, some like, so for example, in this hand, he went, oh, well, let's, let's cover what happened on the river, and then I'll say why, uh, like one note, why that might not work at super low. Sure. So he goes with this bet. You raise about pot. He goes with a jam. Is pot is pot approved by me? Yeah, yeah. Pot's a great size here, for sure. You, I'll, I'll even I'll show you. In a I second. wasn't sure if I was supposed to be going smaller because I know his range would be mostly. I thought it'd be mostly bad flushes and two pairs and top pairs. You want to be you want to be pretty polar. Yeah. You want to okay. be pretty polar facing it. Uh, I think. Um, then he jams me. And then he jams you. And this is where I'm sitting here thinking, this guy literally shows me the nuts every single time. <laughs> <laughs> this really just happened to me early in this tournament again. Yeah, because I mean, um, he definitely has it, right? He has, you know, 10-8 of diamonds yeah. and 8 of diamonds. That's two real combos of just straight flushes. Yeah, and he probably played them all somewhat similarly, right? Yep. Yep, totally anyway, agree. Whatever, I don't care. Yeah, Call but at the end of the day, you, you're like, okay, this guy's a good player. He's going to find some bluffs. I, I was sitting here thinking in game, is it better to call with a random 10 of diamonds in my hand? But I wouldn't raise with a 10 of diamonds in my hand, right? Well, you would have traps, right? So your ace, eight of diamonds will trap some amount on the turn. And so obviously calling with that hand is like your number one bluff yeah. catcher. Well, it's the super nuts. Yeah, it's the super nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So but no, I'm asking, say, say I did decide if I if I had a hand like ace with a ten of diamonds that I did bet the turn, okay. and he bets the river for two, I guess I probably should raise, right? Yeah, yeah, let's look at it. And, and then if he jams me, that's probably a pretty good call too, because once I raise big, he's probably not. I mean, I guess he'll still jam the ace, right? Yeah, that's that is the issue here, right? It's, a tough it's spot. like, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna find a tiny amount of jams here. Okay, so slow down. Let's take a look. To, let's discuss what we're talking about. He bets tiny, and now it's on me. Okay. Exactly. So, and so here has how your diamonds will play. So raise ninety three is half pot. Raise one seventy six is pot. The other size is all in. Yep. For a gigantic amount, by the way. For a gigantic amount, correct. Like nine times pot or something. Yep. <laughs> Yep. I'm probably not ripping it for nine times pot, not going to lie. So that's probably yeah, I, I, To be fair, it's only 2% of the time, so whatever. It looks yeah, like I think that's pot fine to miss. <laughs> so what are we raising? Go back to all of our hands. This is only diamonds, I think. Trying to get off of it. There we go. Okay. So we are raising with, notice like pocket eights. Kind of interesting. With a diamond. So small, small raise for thin value, right? That makes some sense. If I did have the 10 of diamonds, like ace 10... You want to hover over that one ace 10 you see where the 10 of diamonds does raise right so say yep. i did raise here and we get jammed i think that's got to be a call right i don't think so no so no. your 10 of diamonds okay. folds and that's yeah. because we presume he is jamming some ace high exactly because i wasn't i wasn't sure in the spot like does the blocker matter more or does the ace matter more you also want to think about his bluffs right so when you have the 10 of diamonds, you're blocking exactly one combo of a straight flush. But he there's, also... There's only two. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's but half he, of them. But what's he going to have in his hand when he bluffs? Yeah, I guess I wasn't sure if he would rip it in in the spot with the ace of diamonds. No, no. I mean with the 10 of diamonds, right? Say he has the eight or the 10 of diamonds. Even though you're blocking the nuts, mm -hmm. you're also blocking his potential bluffs. Sure, sure. And so, that yeah, it's sense. not... Yeah. Yeah, I'm blocking yeah. half his bluffs too. So maybe it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, maybe it's uh it's typically more important to like in this spot it's weird because there's only two values of combo, but it's typically more important to block bluffs or to unblock bluffs rather. Go back to um, his raise all in size, please. His raise size, his raise uh all in. Look at look at his raising all in range. So it does contain ace X, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that therefore he'd much rather have the ace. And actually, this is a cool spot. And this sometimes happens on four flush boards where... Wait, does he not have eight, six, and does he not even have straight flushes here? 
Not much. Where'd they go? So he would have played them differently at some point, presumably? Eight, six of diamonds plays a bet 25 size. Mm, so that's where they went. So imagine he bets 25 now, because I want to keep those in. He bets 25. We raise to, let's say, 136, which is probably roughly what I do. Then he rips it in, and now he needs to see if ace 10 calls. No, still. Okay. Yeah, just, just an equity thing, I think. Yeah, this is where it gets kind of convoluted, where there's a bunch of sizing options, because I'm not even sure the opponents use all the sizing options. Chris Brewer probably does. Yeah, of course. he's super studied. But a lot of people in the spot literally have, like, two best sizes, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's much more important on, like, overall range construction, right? right? And so I don't get too caught up in the fact that, like, he loses 8-6 when he bets 10, because when you raise and he jams, he's still jamming with a, a perfectly balanced strategy. And so, yeah, you, you don't have to, like the blockers may interact and change a little bit, but it's it, it's still just a very, very reasonable strategy that you're going to play against it. Right. So anyway, like it's not like the ace of diamonds, right? All the ace of diamonds always call. What about king of diamonds? King of diamonds is where you start to mix. Yeah, okay. Okay, whatever. Ace, ace, ace just has to call. I can't go around folding ace, I flushes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if your opponent yeah. enjoys a good bluff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so what, what should he be bluffing with in this spot? Yeah, so this, this was the interesting point, is that he actually went too thin, uh, or not too thin, rather. He used, he didn't go thin enough. And so he put Jack 8 of Diamonds uh, into a bet 10 size. And Jack it really wants... Jack 8 with a diamond, with the 8 of diamonds. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah my bad. Jack 8 with a diamond into a bet 10 size. And it really should be using like a bet 25% pot. And so this is what concerns me about raising the bet 10 too much, is that if people don't go big enough for value. Like for the eight of diamonds, it's worth 25% pot on the river. But if they only go 10% pot on the river, all of a sudden they don't need to defend two parity of raises anymore because they just have the eight of diamonds mm -hmm. more often, right? So that's why I get concerned about raising bet tens too much because if people put too strong of hands into that middling section of their range for a bet 10 size, all of a sudden they have a really easy time defending against raises. Okay. Cool. That makes cool. sense. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, they just have more nuts, effect, or callable hands, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, well, I you think have this... to ask: Will my opponent actually call my raise with the eight of diamonds? Some people even fold that. They shouldn't, yeah. but some people do. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think it'd be hard for him to fold that. Uh, yeah. But and, I'm telling and you, though, like a lot of people will. A lot of people who like know they're supposed to have some small bets here, they'll do it, and then they get raised. Like, oh man, well, you must have the nuts. Yeah, 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 for sure. So for sure. Look for those players. There's there spots like this where you can you can really crush some players. All right, next yeah. game. We got to go a little bit faster. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Justin gets bogged Actually, down with all these GTO hands. He wants to... Yeah, sorry. Perfectly. <laughs> sorry, let's let's uh, let's do this as the last one, and, right. and it will restart. So in this hand, Chibwick opens. You three bet the 9-8 suited, which is great. Fold, call. Um, in this spot... I think, as you know, you're going to be like really linear. You're deep stacked. You need to have good playability. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to want to use a hand like, uh, you know, you're not going to want to use ugly blocker looking hands in your strategy, like an ace 5-0 or like king 5-0 or something crazy like that. You just want to have stuff with pretty good playability. Yeah. I mean, so I, just, make... I look at the chart and I do what the chart says. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, <laughs> that's probably good and reasonable, especially against Chidwick. Right? Yeah, I just want to do what the chart says. Yeah. And this is the hand where I was saying that, it's pretty sick to develop a lot of raises in position because here we go. Ace King seven rainbow. You go for a, a third pot bet, which is reasonable. He calls. But what I think happens in game a lot is people just bet third pot with their entire range. Yeah. And they're good enough to know what they should be three betting here with. Mm -hmm. And I so they know. I know I'm definitely checking your son, but okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I just think like 40% checks in general from population seems really hot. It does. It, does. it seems really high. People just have to look at like you know queen nine back doors and just play almost pure check. Yeah, you know yeah. queen eight. I think people look for the cheap bluff a lot in this spot. Yeah, I probably do bet a lot of the unpaired hands here. Too many of them. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. No, me too. I mean, I, th I think it's hard. I think the I think I would have checked a lot of ace x and king x a, a bad ace x and king x. Yeah. And I would have checked a lot of under pairs, and I would have probably bet too many garbage hands. I mean, what's the nine eight do? Nine eight apparently checks some. Yeah, nine eights has some checks. Uh, Which pretty is heavy total garbage. Though. Yeah, it's okay to give up a total garbage out of position. Yeah, and I actually like. I think that this is a good point. Is that you have to you have to differentiate what's total garbage and what makes more sense to bet. And back door this, draws. You got a back door draw. Exactly. Not total right? garbage. That's that's a huge that, that's a huge difference. Um, 
because it just allows you to barrel more turns right because you turn more equity more often right i'm sure if you went through all these hands the back door draws bet and the diamonds don't yeah as often yep look at that 10 8 9 8 yeah it's just 10 9 jack 10 has the has the straight draw with it so it, it's betting at a high frequency yeah yeah gunshots can definitely bet for sure yeah but i think like that's a pretty easy rule of thumb it's like when you have the backdoor draw, bat. When you don't play a pure check, mm -hmm. like you're going to be a little bit off in the frequencies, but I think that's a totally reasonable way to play this spot. Okay. So you go for the bet 33, and if you think somebody is betting 33 too often, all of a sudden you can develop a lot of raises with like low hands that don't interact at all, like a five seven of diamonds, six seven of diamonds. So so so, you know, so you're essentially saying in this spot that if he thinks we're betting too often, look at this chart, see the hands that are reasonable raises, and raise with them way more exactly yeah so yeah. notice the the garbage is raising right yeah the garbage yeah, you know, five four, five, four six, back five, doors five. right yeah i yeah. don't think many players find these bluffs <laughs> yeah i I, to I totally agree with you but but i think that they're, they're actually really good to use in game yeah um, i mean people yeah. overfold to aggression in general i think agreed yeah for sure for sure and it's and they see that too much so you have you have c betting too much and you have overfolding it's like you should just be raising a ton in the spot and be oh, super we're we punting off left and right next time i go play yeah welcome welcome yeah. <laughs> I, I actually I had a spot like this in, in the in the recent 10k where i got three bet it was small blind versus hijack and that 25 percent pot on um uh king queen six and I had five, four backdoor and I was like, well, this seems like a reasonable one. And I raise and he just tanks forever. Very clearly just having ace high or something like that and just folds. <laughs> and I'm like, sweet. <laughs> so yeah, these spots come up. I think, it, I think it's good to find these like backdoor type stuff. And cause I mean, even, even when he raised, like he has to call every King in the deck except for his like worst blocker Kings. Yeah. I mean, and the queen 10 calls, Jack 10 calls. Yeah. Nobody calls Jack 10 when they bet the flop and get raised out of position. Yeah. Yeah. It's like good luck, right? <laughs> good, good luck defending the strategy. And yeah, you like, know what's let's just take a look at this real quick. So they have to call back gut shot with backdoor flush draw, right? That's Even without they have to call all, all pairs that with a you know pair on the board plus yeah. gut shot backdoor flush draw. You may be say, why does Queens fold but nine seven calls? Because nine seven has more outs. For sure. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Cool. And one one thing that's cool in the spot is this is actually kind of a big race size. You know, 33 to 116. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you just made it 75. Yeah, they gotta call way more. Exactly. Probably they don't all, get to... the, all the pairs. Probably exactly. like all cut back toward cut shots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So if you think somebody's C betting the spot a lot, I would look to use a lot of small raises in position. Mm -hmm. And I think small raises in position are really sick in general. All right. Well, I'm going to have this one on my to do list. Good. Good. <laughs> uh, I can't, can't wait for, to see that hand history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Chidwick calls, and then you get the six of diamonds. Yeah, and it goes Badoogie on the turn. And so I think that this is like kind of a cool spot because when it comes to the flush draw, let's look at it. It becomes pretty easy to find your bluffs. Like if it comes with the six of hearts, your hearts just get to barrel at a really high frequency. Click on clubs here to see what happens to the clubs. They are, they are not so much. And they're going to they have the draw, right? Exactly. They're going to barrel at a much lower frequency. Right. And this is a common thing where if you turn the back door flush draw, you just keep betting. Because exactly. we're also betting with all our good hands, right? Especially out of position, right? right? But when it goes Badoogie, you have to find... It's a little bit trickier to pick your bluffs, right? Because you don't have any flush draws. There's no lot. There's fewer logical ones. There's, exactly. There's yeah. fewer logical ones. And that's where and you just so, have to, like, take some random stuff and try. <laughs> yeah, and now 9-8 goes pure. Yeah. Right? Whereas on the six of hearts, you differentiate. Excuse me. And you, and you barrel more hearts. When it goes rainbow, you have to use 9-8 as a pure barrel on the turn because there's less intuitive bluffs and right. it's one of your intuitive bluffs. Okay. Notice that six, five is betting and eight, six is betting. I think that was a little bit dicey. I don't think I would have bet those. I mean, this yeah, is something so, I've been trying, like really trying to implement is these bottom pair type bluffs. It, yeah. Call yeah. And I think bluffs of value. That's whatever these things are. Yeah. I don't know what these things are, but uh, GTO does it. Yeah. I, I think that you see it most commonly in position versus big blind spots, ace, king, X. When you turn the two pair, they become, or when you turn the two pair blocker, rather, mm -hmm. they become extremely good barrels. Um, because when you bet this hundred size, he has a six, he has king six, he has seven six. And so blocking those two pair combos is just huge. Um, and when you turn a six, you really don't have that much showdown value, right? right. You only really have showdown against exactly jack 10, queen 10, queen jack. 
Yeah, not a lot. And a little bit of these low pairs. And those hands have loads of equity. Exactly. And they're also going to bluff you at some frequency. Right. Right. So, so you're not going to realize they fold. Like that's fine. Yes. Fine and good. Absolutely. And so blocking two pair combos in this spot is just really great. We're going to have to go back and update the tournament masterclass because uh, this is a hard thing to throw in there. For sure. It's, it is tough. It happens you know, a lot. Pay attention to that. There, there's a lot of spots. Well, some spots come up like this on the turn, especially where you just got to go for it. Got to try to put in the bluff. And it's, it's hard to add that into, into an implementable strategy because it's not all the time it happens. But you're saying it's ace high boards in particular. Ace king x boards um, are very, very common for it. Okay. One of these fun corner cases we have to figure out. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We, right. we can go through a bunch of ace king boards and, and just go through all the spots where you see this uh, two pair blockers bluff. Is ace king and ace queen effectively the same boards? Ace queen. Yeah. Yeah. Ace, absolutely. Ace. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to happen a lot. And, and one thing to keep in mind is it's typically when you have a tighter range. If you open the button, for example, 55 or 55% of hands, and then it comes to the six, then you don't use two pair blockers because you have. 10 five suited. You have so many unpaired 10 highs and jack highs and stuff like that. But when you open an early position, for example, with like 17% of hands, where can you draw your bluffs from? Right? You don't have as many hands to draw bluffs from. So then your six becomes really good. And so in this spot, you're playing a tight range situation where you three bet the small blind. So you don't have like, you know, eight, nine offsuit to be bluffing with on the turn and have a bunch of combos of it. Right. You have to use logical hands. And so when you're having a tighter range, now the two pair blocker becomes extremely pertinent. And you don't really want to use a hand like jack nine, right? This is an air ball. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Especially out of position, you need equity. You need equity. Okay, cool. So, so what, you what go, in the world's happening in this hand? I don't remember what I had. All right, so you, bet, so yeah, definitely you barrel for the bet 60, which is great. And then the opponent calls and you get not a fun river. Oh God. Yeah. Seven so this is a tough spot because he's just going to call me literally every ace every time, right? Yeah. And he's going to have a lot yeah. of ace. He's going to have a lot of king. He's going to have the gut shots. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to bet tiny here, actually. I thought bet small would be kind of neat, but then he just like made randomly hero call me <laughs> with the yeah. jack or something. Yeah. Um, I don't think betting tiny makes too much sense for your overall strategy. Um, yeah, I agree. Like, what, I mean, we're too shallow. Like, like if you have shallow. pocket aces, I guess, that, that makes some sense to bet tiny. But let's think about more so what makes a good bluffing candidate on the river. I think I actually asked you about this hand afterwards, and I was thinking, like, do I even want to attempt a bluff here? <laughs> yeah. And, and so, uh, I, I, so I want to block his calls, right? I want to block his auto calls. So what are yep. auto calls? I mean, an ace, but you can't really block an ace, right? Well, you, can you? I mean, you can block what's, like ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, ten. Right? Well, what's the best suit to not have so you block the most aces? This is where I get a little confused. So on the flop, he's going to have all these spades, clubs, and hearts. So I guess I want to have diamonds, right? Is that right? Um, so that's typically how it works with backdoor flush draw spots. But in this spot, you have the ace of spades on the board. Mm -hmm. So when you have the eight, nine of spades, mm -hmm. you don't block any of his suited aces. See what I'm saying? When I have nine, eight of spades. Yep. I do not block any of his suited Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Because he can have three aces here. Gotcha. He can have, gotcha. Yeah heart diamond uh club right and so you want to have heart diamond club in your hand to block the most aces suited aces in his range so i want to have this hand yes and i don't and want to have nine is i don't have any i don't have spades well i guess well yes. yeah yeah so spades are bad because of also this seven which is which is like pretty tricky to know in game but i didn't know it in game <laughs> yeah well it's, it, it's hard right because like when you have the eight of clubs you're also you're blocking ace eight of clubs you're unblocking his suited king eight right because the king of clubs is on the board and you're blocking his eight seven of clubs mm. so it's actually really sick to have the eight of clubs it's in your actually hand a good blocker yeah yeah Funny right enough, like I, I, I would not have found it and i'm glad see this is the stuff justin does in his spare time he figures out the answer <laughs> <laughs> i love this stuff man i love yeah, this why stuff. does the solver bluff the nine eight of clubs 100 percent? is the question because yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's probably about what's in the incoming Let's um, see. And, uh, and there we go, right? One. Yep. So nine eight of spades plays really heavy check because when we jam, and so nine of clubs bluffs here, the EV of, of your bluff is worth uh, six into three sixty six. So it is worth essentially nothing, right? Less than two percent of the pot. Check then. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so I have a right. Question about this. Imagine your EV is basically nothing. Should yeah. you just not do it to ensure you stay in the tournament? 
especially if you're down to like half the field or two thirds of the field even, you know, it's like, there's merit, yeah. right? You don't have to take your six stop, six, six change right into whatever this is. I know how much money this is like nothing. Yeah. Six into 366. Yeah. I, I can't even count that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> 2% of 2% of the size of the pot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can, you can have it. You can have it. Yeah. Too. Yeah. It's close. <laughs> it's close in these spots. Now, now can you create an overfold where your bluff makes more EV? No. Chibik always calls. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Possible. He always calls me. I show him bluffs every single time I play with him. <laughs> That's another issue yeah. I have is that I've bluffed it off in him like seven times. He's just like showed me nuts every time. Or there's there's calls. There's a hundred percent merit in that. Hundred percent merit in, in that. It's it's not worth that much. I think in my mind it's way more important to be thinking about what combos are good. Um, sure. That so, way you okay, don't. Here's explain. another question for GTO expert: Why the nine eight of diamonds? Um, same concept. You're blocking ace nine of diamonds, mm -hmm. and you're blocking. Eight, oh, seven. The other them. question then, why not the, why not the hearts? Um, the hearts don't match the seven. So when you have the hearts in your hand, you can't have eight, seven. Or you can, you're not blocking eight, seven. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then so, so like here's here's how what I think is important. It's like your queen jack, pure give up. Okay. Queen 10, pure give up. Jack 10, pure give up. And then and you're why are we giving up these in particular? And it's going to be because those are big folding portions of his range. So you're blocking his auto folds. Exactly. Which is a problem. Exactly. So you're blocking wait, wait, his wait, auto wait, wait, folds. If you have if you have Queen Jack here and you block or you block the King the King Queen, so you can't have King Queen as often. Therefore, we should if you can't have King Queen as often, though that's good for Oh, that's bad for us. You're right. I'm sorry. That's bad for us. Sorry that's for getting all confused here. No, no, it's this stuff's hard. I mean it's I mean, it's we, easy we just, to get turned around. It seems like it shouldn't be all sure. that difficult because there's only two ways to go. But it's easy no, to it's go it's hard. The wrong way. It's hard, man. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. So, but I mean, I think in my mind, that's what's important. It's like, you can choose or not to choose to bluff this in game for a million reasons. Mm -hmm. But if you do bluff this with Queen Jack, that's an error. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like that, that would be an error to bluff that hand. Um, same with like the Queen 10, Jack 10. And then if you can think about which suits matter the most... I think that's just going to be beneficial for hundreds of spots. Sure. Um, and so like matching certain combos is, is super nice in, in a spot like this. And that should be pertinent because look at his snap calls, right? Snap calls, nine, seven of clubs, right? Eight, seven of clubs. So you really want to have a nine and an eight. Exactly. And like I said, you can't really block the ACE, right? So that's yeah. not so relevant. Um, yeah, for sure. So his King's actually supposed to fold to a shove. Yep. Hmm. I, I, I kind of presumed you would find some calls with some kings. Yeah, and, and we see that it's kind of like a similar thing um, in terms of the blocker effect where his, like, king six is a great bluff catcher. It's Because it blocks some of my, my nuts. I mean, maybe pop, pocket kings, but not that much, right? Well, you I barely have pocket sixes. And I can a have, tiny uh, bit of sixes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess... I was thinking can... I could have seven six, but I guess maybe I don't. Maybe I don't even play a preflop. I don't know. I don't guess, think I gave guess you guess a play a preflop. Yeah. I mean, maybe you do in game a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that could certainly be reasonable in game to, to choose the six, just in case you ever play seven six like that or pocket sixes. Um, but more importantly, like the king queen o, but you're not bluffing with a queen in your hand. So that's actually a little bit interesting. Oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> down the rabbit yeah. hole. You can always be on that hole. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I thought he would in game clearly and correctly, that he would call with some kings, which made me, like, really inclined to not bluff. Because I know he has yeah. all the a lot of aces, right? I know he has yeah, some sure. sevens. I know he has some kings that are going to call some. I thought they were going to call some. So I like it to give up. Yeah, I think it's perfectly perfectly good. Perfectly good and reasonable hand. And he calls he up showing, time. He ends up showing a pure call, so that feels really good, too. Could you too, imagine right? if he just shows me, like, the, the jack 10 or something? The queen sick. jack. That would yeah. hurt. That would hurt. <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes for me. If I check yeah. there on the river, is he supposed to be bluffing the queen jack? Let's see. Some portion of the time. Yeah. I think, he needs I to think that was probably going to be. I mean, look, find his bluffs, right? Yeah, good luck. Like, he has no bluffs, pretty much. So, he's going to bluff some of those. So. That's actually why he calls these hands on the turn, for the most part. It's like, like when you barrel, when you bet flop, barrel turn, calling jack 10 no back door is, like, pretty ugly. But one of the reasons why it makes it a call is that it 
it becomes a good bluffing candidate on different runouts, mm -hmm. which gains it more EV than just its raw equity of like how often am I hitting a queen? Yeah, a lot of people ask like come to me saying you can't call this hand because you're not getting anywhere near the right pot odds plus implied odds, but you get to bluff sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. It's right like, here, you have no bluffs, so you, you need some bluffs. For sure. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine you always fold these hands. You literally have an ace, king, or seven every single time on the river. What are you going to bluff with? Right. Right. It's going to always bluff with seven. Like that seems crazy. Some people hear you say that and think, "Oh, that's good. You just have all the nuts." No, that's bad. <laughs> it's bad to have only the nuts. Believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Because that essentially means you're not making money with all of these junky hands. Because by playing this hand in this way, it is making you some money right yeah and if yeah you make some money that's good for you for sure all right so that's all the hands we have for now i think we'll be back with some more hands later hope you're enjoying this series if you do let us know good luck in your games have fun gto is hard but um we're gonna do our best and continue improving together thank you very much justin thanks guys thanks jonathan talk to you soon